Sing this together. Amen. We're turning in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6. Can I just say, for those who um, are going to London, have just told me today, if you see me in the kitchen just behind the pulpit here after the service, I have a little form for you. And also, there were some people this morning asked me after the service for membership cards, and I'm afraid I didn't have them this morning. So if you ask, then I'll be in the kitchen, got the cards with me tonight, and I'll gladly give those to you. So to see me afterwards in uh, the kitchen just behind the pulpit here. We're going to read from verse number 13. We know what the circumstances are from having studied it this morning. The king of Syria is angry because his plans to attack Israel have been thwarted. Elisha has been identified as a problem. Elisha is the one who has told uh, the king of Israel the things that the king of Syria was speaking about in his bedroom. And therefore, he has now devised a plan that he's going to try and silence the man of God. He's going to try and silence Elisha. And we take up then the reading from verse 13. And the king of Syria said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host encompassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And a servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. 
And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed and said unto the, uh, unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word, for thy truth, for the second reading today of this passage of thy word. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us not just to understand what happened historically, but, O oh Lord, the principles that we can apply to our hearts spiritually. Help us, O oh Lord, to hear thy voice saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. We pray, Lord, you'll bless God's people and instruct them tonight. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'll speak to the lost and bring them to Christ tonight. And our prayer and our heart's desire is that our Lord would be seen, heard, and accepted tonight in this gathering. Empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. And give me help to deliver the word of God to the glory of thy name. For these things we pray humbly and yet believing in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Once again, the focus of the devil is upon the Christian. You'll find that whenever you go to do a work for the Lord, and you're serving the Lord, and whenever you're a man of faith, like Elisha, that you will be in the sight of the devil. Now, while that should cause us enough concern to pray that the Lord will give us wisdom and protection and give us help to resist him, it should not paralyze you as a Christian. Sometimes there's that thought that comes into your mind, well, if I really step out for God, I fully surrender, and I do what I really should be doing and serve the Lord, well, then I'm going to get a target on my back, and there's going to be nothing but trouble from the devil. And in a sense, there is truth there, because if you're serving the Lord, then you will be known. However, we are not to be paralyzed with fear, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And therefore we go in Jesus' name, in his strength we go. And here we see the persistence of the enemy seeking to hinder the prophet or the believer in this day. Now it's interesting to note, he said, go and spy, verse 13, where he is. Go and spy where he is. You know something, you don't need to go looking for the enemy of the Lord. You do not need to go looking for the enemy of the soul, for he'll find you. There's no doubt about that. You don't need to seek him out, because he is busy. He will seek you out, and he will seek to hinder your walk with the Lord. Now, what exactly he was going to do to Elisha, we don't know. It could have been that he was actually planning to kill Elisha. We're not entirely sure. But whenever we think about the enemy of our souls, we're reminded that there's certain things that he seeks to do to the believer. He seeks to discourage the believer. That's one of the ploys and the tactics of Satan, to try and discourage us, to get us so weary and disheartened and discouraged that we do nothing. Now, there are times that life is very difficult. There are times that life is very hard. A friend, the devil doesn't have any sympathy at all. And you might be facing a difficult and rough time in your life, and that's a time he'll come in with great discouragement, that you might be disabled from doing any further work for the Lord or going any further in your walk with God. Not only will the devil seek to discourage, he'll seek to destroy. It might be that he's seeking to destroy your testimony. He is seeking to take away your joy. He's seeking to destroy your relationships and friendships with other godly people. And the devil seeks to do that. He also seeks to divide. He seeks to divide. And his joy is to see brother at odds with brother, sister at odds with sister, separating into their camp, separating one from another. What does the word of God tell us? That it is good for brethren to dwell together in unity. Why? Because there the Lord commandeth the blessing. 
And I say to you, dear believer, if there is something between you and another brother or something between you and another sister, put it right. Don't miss out on the blessing of God because the devil's got a hook on you or a hold on you and there's bitterness creeping in. Praise God. There is victory over discouragement. There's victory over the attacks of the devil seeking to destroy us. There's victory over division. There's reconciliation and we can be reconciled in Christ and that's what we need to be. And therefore, you don't need to go looking for the enemy just like Elisha, the enemy, came looking for him. And then in verse number 14, it says, Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. Here we have the weapons of war being gathered. Have you ever stopped to think, how many people were they coming for? How many people did they want? One. They wanted Elisha. But look at what they brought. The horses the chariots, a great host coming by night encompassing the city. There must have been so many of them. And the devil doesn't do things by halves. The enemy of the Lord doesn't go in half-heartedly. And here there is an onslaught of the wicked one against a man of God. We think about the fact that our enemy has plenty of resources and plenty of his people at his disposal to use against believers. There's no shortage of those that defy God. There's no shortage of those that mock God and the people of God and delight to cause trouble for the church and for the believers, maybe even in your own home, maybe even in your workplace, maybe in your neighborhood there are those. And while you wouldn't call it out-and-out -out persecution, there's a snide remark. There's a roll of the eyes, there's a mockery. When you stand for the Lord, simply because you love the Lord, oh, the devil has many at his disposal. Look at the things he brought. He brought the horses, he brought the chariots. What's this? This is weapons of war. These are weapons of war. He's not messing about here. These are the weapons of war, the physical weapons of war. We notice that there was a great host. We notice their tactics. They came by night. They came by night. Why is that significant? Because of the deceitfulness of the whole matter. This wasn't something that could be done in the open. This was something that was deceitful. It was under the cover of nightfall. And friend, it shouldn't surprise us in any shape or form. Because the works of the devil and the hearts of the unsaved are dark as night. How do I know that? Well, in John chapter 3, in verse number 16, turn with me there, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world and that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. And there we see that the works of the sinner and all of those things are darkness. And they like the darkness. They feel that there's security in the darkness because of the darkness of their hearts and the darkness of their minds. And here we read that this is their very condemnation, that they hate light, they hate truth, they hate the things of God. But praise the Lord, we read also in 1 John and chapter 3, verse number 8, while he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And you see, whenever we think of Christ coming into this world to save from sin, he has come to save us from the works of the devil, from those works of darkness, those works of wickedness, those works that condemn our soul. And praise God tonight for you who are living in the darkness of sin and in the wickedness of sin. 
and in the ugliness of sin. Praise God, there's deliverance for you. Why? Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's the message that the Lord Jesus Christ was proclaiming to Nicodemus that night whenever he explained about men loving darkness rather than light. And if you continue in your sin, and if you continue in the darkness of sin, friend, you will go into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. They compass the city about. Oh, you see, the enemy of Elisha and the enemies of God, they've got their posts and they've got their markers and they're just waiting for the attack. I think it's wonderful that one man can cause such trouble. One man can shake the enemy. The hymn writer William Kuyper wrote these words, what various hindrances we meet when coming to the mercy seat, but who that knows the worth of prayer but wishes to be often there. Prayer makes the darkened clouds withdraw. Prayer climbs the ladder Jacob saw, gives exercise to faith and love, brings every blessing from above. Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright. Listen to these words. And Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. And Elisha had been on his knees with God. And God had blessed Elisha. And God had uh, defeated the plans of the wicked one because of Elisha. And here we have an army because of one man. Friend, what would it be if the ones and the twos came together and sought the Lord? Oh, we ought to be making hell tremble in our prayer meetings. We ought to be making hell tremble on a daily basis as we get before God. Surrender ourselves afresh. Pray for the needs of the land, for our church, for our homes. And as I thought about this verse and this man, he's wasting no time. He sends the enemy in to attack the man of God. Time is short, isn't it? We're nearer the return of the Lord than we've ever been before. And the devil is busy, busy making plans busy making plans that will thwart the people of God and the work of God. Whenever we come to verse 15, what happens? We see that the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth and behold, and host encompassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and a servant said unto his him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Now, it's interesting to note here that this was a new servant. This wasn't Gehazi, who was the wicked servant, the servant who lied and the servant who took what he shouldn't have taken. But this was a new servant. In fact, in verse number uh, 17, he's called a young man. The eyes of the young man were opened. And therefore, this was a young man. He wasn't long into his training. He wasn't long into his work of serving Elisha. And perhaps because of that, he had yet to see Elisha do some great miracle. So whenever he came out and he looked around, what he saw frightened him. He was troubled by what he saw. And that's a human reaction. Whenever we see things that are out of our control, whenever we see things that seem to be against us, then we are fearful. You see, as he looked out, he knew who those people were. Most likely their banners displayed who they were. And as he looked out, he knew that the king of Syria was coming, or certainly his army was coming, that there was a real threat to Elisha's life, possibly to his as well, possibly to anybody who tried to stand in the way. And that's maybe why they had so many people coming against Elisha in case people tried to protect him. There was an imminent threat. There was a real threat. But remember this, it was a permitted threat. God permitted it. God allowed this to happen. And we know by the words of the young man, and by the response of Elisha, that this man was afraid. He was afraid. Because Elisha had said to him in the next verse, fear not. And he said, alas, my master, how shall we do? He was worried. Worried over what was going to happen. Friend, is there someone tonight in this meeting? 
a child of God, and you're looking at the world tonight, you're afraid. Maybe you're looking at circumstances in your home, and you're afraid. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's an attack of the evil one. Maybe it's something that you've been praying for and praying for and praying for, and it hasn't come, and your heart's fearful that the Lord will not fulfill that promise. This was a dark moment for this man. This was a real moment. This was genuine trial. It presented genuine danger. And praise God. Praise God. There's a word in scripture for those who lift their eyes and see the wickedness of man. Let's be honest tonight. Wickedness is rising. The influence of the ungodly is growing in our land. What was once abhorred is accepted. And now we're being forced and told that we must not only accept it, but celebrate it. And we see wickedness being exalted and promoted. And if we're honest, being successful, being successful to a certain degree. And we look around and we see great darkness on every hand. But I rejoice that God is a word for such times. God is a word for such times. Turn with me to Psalm number two. Because in Psalm two, we read really a commentary. It could be a commentary, I suppose, in Second Kings chapter six. It could be a commentary in our day. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain or an empty thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Read these words. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. I'm praying maybe in your heart tonight there's fear, panic. You're even tempted to think, is this supposed to happen? Does the Lord really know what's going on? Let's enter into the throne room of heaven tonight. There's no panic there. No one's flustered in glory. No, the Lord's looking upon the plans and the plotting of the wicked of those who have authority in this world and the Lord's laughing and friend when you read about the laughter of the Lord in scripture it's often connected with judgment he's laughing because their plans are so foolish their plans are to stop the cause of Christ to stop the church to stop the Christian to stop the work of God, to stop God doing what he promised he's going to do. That's what their plans are. And friends, sometimes we're worried and sometimes we panic and sometimes our hearts feel us for fear, but God is in the heaven and he is not afraid, but rather he's laughing at such foolishness because none can stand against God and prosper. God is our refuge and our strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. We will not fear. Though every reasoning around us would say, you need to be afraid, you need to be afraid, because what's happening? God's word says, we will not fear. And that's exactly what Elisha said to his young servant. As we come to verse number 16, and he answered, fear not, fear not. Are there any sweeter words to hear in a time of trouble than the words of the voice of God saying, fear not, fear not. And friend, not only does Elisha give the command to fear not, and if that's all he said, that would be enough, but he gives the reason why we ought not to fear. 
He gives the explanation. He backs up his command with the reasoning. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now that man is standing that day and he's looking around. And according to his calculations, there's one, two people here and a host encamped around about us. And humanly speaking, it looks very bleak. But listen to what Elisha says. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And I'll tell you, you need to be sure tonight that you're on the Lord's side. You're on the winning side. You're on the victory side. You're on the side that's marching to heaven and to home. You see, there are many people in this world tonight and they take great comfort in the fact that they are in the majority the majority that aren't saved, the majority that don't go to church, the majority that mock the things of God, the majority that live whatever way they want to. And that's their comfort. Well, everybody else is doing it. I'm just like everybody else. My friend, you see, whenever you stand before God, you'll not stand with the crowd. And you'll not stand with people mocking and sniggering and laughing and urging you on to be a fool. But you'll stand before God and the host of heaven and give an account of the life that you have lived. I'd rather be numbered among the people of God than with the majority that are going to hell. I'd rather be mocked by the millions than rejected by my Christ. Now I'll tell you, looking at that, humanly speaking, it seemed that the enemy had the upper hand. But they hadn't reckoned on the fact that our God's a great God. He is an almighty God. And there is nothing too difficult for him. There's no one too hard for him. And friend, if you're on the Lord's side tonight, then there's no reason for you to fear. I want to simply read through a few verses that say, fear not. From Genesis right through to Revelation. If you want to take a note of these references, please do. Genesis 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came on to Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And what is the Lord saying there? Do not be afraid, for I will protect you, and I will provide everything that you need. And friend, tonight, if you are not saved, you need the protection of God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for the day of judgment. And praise God, everything you need, he will supply through Christ. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, before they went into the promised land, hear these words, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And friend, that promise is still true today. Do not be afraid of the enemies of God. Do not be afraid. For the Lord your God, he it is that doth go with you. He will not fail thee. He will not forsake thee. Remember, being taught in the Bible class in this very church, one with God as a majority. One with God as a majority. You think of uh, Isaiah 41 verse 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Your Redeemer, the one who bled and died for you, says, I will help you. Friend, God will personally help his children tonight. Isaiah 43. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, don't stand surprised that there are waters to pass through or fires to walk through. But when thou passest through the fire waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. Joel chapter 2 verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. There's a promise to claim tonight. 
Don't be afraid, but rather praise God. Be glad and rejoice in him. Lift up the victory song as if the battle was already won because we can be sure it will be. The Lord's going to do great things. Among whom? Among the praising people. Among the praising people. Don't you be some miserable, discouraging, downhearted, always pessimistic person and then wonder why there isn't a mighty work being done. Then praise the Lord. Give him the victory. Give him the honor. Give him the praise and glory that's due to his name. And praise God, he will do great things. In Luke 12 and 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God can work among the ones and the twos as well as the hundreds and the thousands. And I say it from Genesis to Revelation. And can I just say there are many, many, many more times in Scripture the words fear not or appear or fear ye not or be not afraid. Revelation 1 verse 7, And when I saw him, that is Christ, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. A friend, whenever we stand before our Savior, the only way we can stand and the only way we can stand with joy is whenever he says, fear not. Fear not. Because the Bible tells me about those who stand without Christ and their hearts will fail them for fear. They'll call on the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them. And having given, given this command to fear not, Elisha prays. Verse 17, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. He prayed that God would give spiritual vision. And I believe we need that in these days. Spiritual vision is clear when the heart is in tune with God. But I'll tell you, whenever someone starts to backslide and grow cold and forget who they are in Christ and forget to humble themselves, then that spiritual vision becomes distorted. It becomes distorted. And whenever we look at this prayer, it was a prayer that the Lord would open this man's eyes. Do you, do you pray that whenever you come to the word of God? Open my eyes, Lord. Help me to see the promises and the provision and the power that you promised to me in this book, in this word. Because that's exactly what this man saw. He saw the provision of God. Oh, most could not see. But Elisha and this young servant saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And you know what that teaches me? The enemy could not have the victory over this child of God. He was protected. God had provided for him. God had given him spiritual protection. There was power here. There was spiritual power here. And God was going to deliver him. Remember, dear believer, he is always there. He has promised by his spirit to be with us. He walks with us and he talks with us. And of course, we cannot see with a human eye, but oh, the Lord is here tonight. And the Lord's walking with you through the valley. And he's there in the hospital room. And he's there in the house of mourning. And he's there in the day of trouble. Praise God. By faith we believe that he is there. And then we come to verse number 18. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed, Unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. What did Elisha do this day? 
Elisha prayed against the enemy. He prayed against the enemy. And God disabled them and stopped them in their tracks. And they were no longer able to fulfill the sinful plans that they had made. And you know what we need to do today? We need to pray against the enemy. That the Lord will stop them in their tracks. That the plans that they have made in the dark places that they want to execute in our land, that God will stop them. God will disable them in some way in his wisdom. And I say to you, remember who the enemy is. The enemy is those who are unsaved and fighting against the things of God. Sometimes God's people are up busy fighting each other. That the enemy's having a field day and sitting back and laughing. Nothing to do today because so and so's fighting with so and so, and my work's done. Friend, we need to pray against the enemy. Join together in unity and pray for the defeat of wickedness and the over march of wickedness in this land. Remember, the devil's tactic is to divide, and if we're divided, then we're not focused on what's going on. We're focused on the problems. Don't be involved in his work. Keep your eyes upon the Lord. Keep your heart right with others. Keep short accounts with God. Forgive and show kindness one to another. And friend, let's start doing battle against the enemy. Let's start doing battle against the devil and pray that the Lord would thwart the plans of wickedness in our land, in our families, in our homes, among our loved ones, whom the devil has in his bondage. Let's pray for a mighty deliverance. Surely it's time for God's people to come together to pray. And I rejoice because there was a great deliverance here. And in the will of the Lord, when we come back next year, we're going to continue uh, through and see how the Lord used the rest of the life of Elisha and even how in this circumstance the Lord won a glorious victory. But the lesson here is very simple. There is victory and there's overcoming for the child of God when they're in tune with the Lord. When they're in tune with the Lord, don't think you can live like the devil and then expect to have deliverance from his attacks. Oh no, we must surrender to the Lord and obey him and go at his bidding and stop at his bidding. And praise God, there's victory for us. And remember all around us, oh, if we could only see, if only we could see the spiritual tonight, the provision God has for us, the angels, the horsemen, the chariots, his very presence. Oh, friend, if only we could see, we'd fear nothing. But we don't need to see. Because the Lord has said it, and faith says, I believe. I believe. Now, this is a gospel meeting. And therefore, before we leave this meeting tonight, I want to apply what we have learned to those who are unsaved. And there's three simple things I want to leave before you. There's still a battle going on today. There's still a battle going on today. There's still two armies. There's still two sides. There are only two places that you can be in. And one is in the army of the Lord, and that's for those who are saved by the grace of God, washed in the blood, who have turned from their sin and trusted in Christ. But there are those who are on the side of the devil. Oh, that's too far. Now, while maybe, you know, while I, I wouldn't call myself a Christian, I think it's a wee bit much for you to say I'm in the sight of the devil. And that's the argument. But reading the word of God, if you're not for me, you're against me. There's only two sides. You see, there's only two destinations. You're either on the devil's side, which we're all born into, by the way. We're born as enemies of God. Or you're either saved and a soldier in the army of the Lord. Can I ask, what side are you on? What army are you in? At the end of the march, where will you be found? Second thing I want to say to the unsaved is that we pray, and we pray tonight in the meeting beforehand, and we continue to pray that the Lord would open your eyes because the Bible tells us that the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of the sinner. 
They're blinded to reality. You see, there's a way that seemeth right unto the sinner, but the ends are over the ways of death. The preacher has declared it. Scripture tells us. But such is the blindness of the sinner that they continue on on the road to hell thinking everything will be okay. Their eyes have not yet been opened to the realities of eternity. You look at how the world depicts eternity. Floating about in heaven with uh, wings and strumming a harp. And then when it uh, depicts hell, it does so in a very flippant manner. Friend, they know nothing of what the scripture teaches of heaven or hell. Heaven is a place of absolute purity and holiness where the people of God gladly worship their God day and night. Where all tears are wiped away, where there's no sickness, there's sorrow, their crying, their death, their illness, their disability. Praise God, all those things are left behind. And hell is the place of utter damnation. No parties in hell. No reunions in hell. When we read of the rich man in hell, he wasn't uh, getting a great group together with the people he went to school with and the people he was in business with. No, not at all. His heart was breaking because he knew that was the place his family was coming to. There was a man in hell that wanted to tell. He wanted to be a missionary out of hell. He was far too late. My prayer is that God will open your eyes even this night, to show you how you truly stand before him. Not what the world thinks about you. Not what your family thinks about you, but what God sees you to be. And friend, as I thought about that, it says, the Lord opened his eyes. And friend, there's coming a day each of us will open our eyes in eternity. What's the first thing you'll see? Will it be the face of your Saviour? Or it will be the darkness of hell. The horror and the realization. I'm lost without any hope. My final thought is this. Those words fear not. What a great command for God's people. But if you're not saved, I can't say it to you. I can't say to you tonight... Fear not and go out into this week. I can't say to you tonight in that hymn that we sang, peace, peace, wonderful peace, may that be your portion tonight. Sinner, I can't say that to you. Because there is no peace for the wicked. There's no peace for the ungodly. You should fear tonight. Oh, dear sinner, you should tremble in your seat. Your face should burn with a crimson glow of shame. And your head should be bowed so far that you can't look up. Because you're in the presence of God. And in your sin. And I cannot say to you, fear not. And I can't say to you, it'll be okay. I can't say, God bless you tonight. All I can do is warn you, if you do not turn from your sin, you'll go out into a lost eternity in hell. Number of people in the list of bereavements we read this week and last week, we're called suddenly out into God's eternity. I was speaking to a dear sister this week, sympathizing with her bereavement. And she said these words, surely God's speaking. Surely he is. You're not immune from death. You'll not necessarily get a warning. Or a deathbed experience. But friend, when it's absent from the body, where will you be in eternity? O turn while the Savior in mercy is pleading. 
steer for the harbor bright. For how do you know but your soul may be drifting over the deadline tonight? Are you saved? Friend, if you're saved tonight, I can say fear not. As well with your soul. But friend, if you're not saved, come to Christ. Let's keep still as we bow our heads and close our eyes and remembering we're still in the presence of the Lord. We haven't time to sing our final hymn, but it will be played on the way out. But I'll read just one verse. O sinner, thine ears have been deaf to his voice. Thine eyes to his glory been dim. The calls of thy Savior have so wearied thee. O what if they should weary him? O sinner, God's patience may weary some day. And leave thy sad soul in the blast. By willful resistance, you've drifted away over the deadline at last. It's not that there isn't a saviour. It's not that there isn't an opportunity. It's not that there isn't blood that can save you and clean. But it's that you won't come. Will you come tonight as you're one in this gathering? And you need to be saved. One in this gathering and you know the Lord's speaking to your soul. Will you trust him now? Will you call upon him? Will this be the night you close in with Christ? Come now. Come now and call on the Lord. And if you've done that, let me know. I'd love to speak to you about going on with the Lord. Maybe you need more help. Maybe you need to speak. Let that be known after the service. I'll take as long as I need. A friend, don't leave without Christ. Dear listener on the internet, don't go away without Christ. This might be your last moment. This might be your last opportunity. Come to Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy stillness tonight. We realize we're in the presence of a thrice holy God. Lord, you know all about us tonight. We can hide nothing from thee. You know our thoughts. You know our heart. Lord, you know our very intentions in this moment. And we will be fearful lest someone in this meeting has already decided that they're going to walk out without thee. Lord, I pray that tonight thou wilt be merciful. And Lord, before they step out into the night air, that thou wilt turn them unto thyself. Oh Lord, forbid it that anything would happen to them before they call. Forbid it, Lord, that tonight they would go out into eternity without thee. But pray, Lord, that they get the matter settled. Oh, Lord, move, we pray. This work man cannot do. But, Lord, speak with a voice that wakes the dead. And make the people here tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. For his glory alone. Amen.